Hello there, this is Alana Tucky. And Steve Tucky. He's sitting next to me on the couch while we make you guys some videos to help you with the Math 033 lecture notes. So here we're going to talk about rate of change. Namely, um, what is it and how does it relate to all this linear stuff we've been learning? So the first thing we want to look at is if the temperature increased by 12 degrees Fahrenheit over three hours, estimate how much the temperature increased per hour. Hmm. All right, well, purr is a very interesting word. Uh, purr is, of course, not like a cat purrs. It's, it's a mathematical term. It means division, right? For each is another way to say it. So they're saying, okay, you know that it increased 12 degrees Fahrenheit over a time of three hours. So what would that mean? It would mean you could take 12 degrees Fahrenheit, divide it by uh, per, divide by three hours. And hopefully everybody knows 12 over 3 makes four so that's four over one right and then you could write it either four degrees over an hour one hour like that or you could write it like this four degrees per hour like that either way both both say four degrees per hour they're both correct right i'll box this one as the correct answer but there you go right so it's saying hey how fast that did that temperature change over time Right? That's what you're looking for. You're saying, okay, there's a change in temperature, and then you want to know its rate, that rate of change. You want to know how fast was your temperature increasing, decreasing, whatever, over the course of time. Right? And that's what we just found. We said, okay, well, it's 12 over 3, so that's 4 degrees Fahrenheit per 1 hour. There is my change per unit time, and that's what rate of change is. Since it was a positive, it was an increase in temperature. Correct. Since it was a positive number, it was an increase, right? And that's how you can tell it's an increase right there. Speaking of which, let's read the next one. If the temperature increased from 60 degrees Fahrenheit at 7 a.m. to 68 degrees Fahrenheit at 11 a.m., estimate the temperature change per hour. Okay, so again, there's that word change. Now, in Unit 1, we learned that change means subtraction, right? So if you want to say, okay, it started at 60 and ended at 68, if you want to find that change, you take 68, take away 60, and you'll find an 8 degree difference, right? So the temperature changed 8 degrees to go from that number to this number, okay? Now what about time? Well, it went from 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. That's a difference of 4 hours, right? And again, be careful with this, because if they had said like 1 p.m. or something, you'd have to be a little bit more careful with your subtractions there, um, because you can't just take 1 minus 7. It doesn't work like that. So you have to kind of think a little bit um, to get that, that hour to change there. It might help if you're on military time. Military time works better for that kind of thing. All right. Now we have our 8 degrees. That was our change in temperature, right? Because that's what we're interested in, rate of change. So how much did we change? 8 degrees over how much time did it take? Four hours, right? And eight over four, we all hopefully know, makes two. So it's two degrees Fahrenheit per hour. Now, how can we tell that's an increase? Well, we can tell it's an increase because it ended up being positive. And for another thing, I mean, you can see it's an increase. Logically speaking, you say, you know, okay, it went from 60 to 68 degrees, that's increase, right? But mathematically, that increase that you guys know is there should show up, and it does in the fact that this is a positive number. Now, why are we bothering with all of this? What's the point, right? How does this relate to lines? Well, slope back here in a boring format like that, sorry, but it is a little boring. Um, it's, it doesn't, it's devoid of meaning. It's just saying, you know, we all know that that slope means something for the graph. It means something for the table and the chart. But on its own, it doesn't really have a lot of context, right, other than other mathematical contexts. But down here, what we're going to try to do is expand on that and say, hey, that slope that you guys know and love as rise over run, it actually has a deeper meaning. It's rise over run, sure, and we all know, hopefully, that that means it's y2 minus y1. That gets you your rise, your lift, your vertical change, your vertical difference, over your run, which is your horizontal, your x2 minus x1 difference. But what's that mean? If it's change in y over change in x, that means that it's a rate of change. It's a speed. Your slope literally is telling you how fast things are changing. Right? So when you calculate slope, you're calculating something else, more or less. And that's what we wrote down here. If, if it's um, 
If either quantity is not changing steadily, then the slope is known as the average rate of change. Remember that a rate of change needs to be a unit ratio. And I kind of wrote up here just a little bit. Unit ratio, unit, uni means one. Like the, the game of Uno, you call out, you know, Uno when you have one card left. Or a unicycle only has one tire, right? Unit ratio means that the denominator is going to be one. So for example, look up here. Both of these ones with these temperatures, see how the denominator is one hour. One hour. When you drive your car, it says you're going 70 miles per hour hour not per three hours right but per hour it's giving you a unit ratio because that's the way unit rates of change have to be written okay all right so let's look at this problem the january sea ice extent for the northern hemisphere decreased approximately linearly from 15.5 million square kilometers in 1979 to 13.6 million square kilometers in 2006. Now I went in here and I underlined kind of the key points. You know, as good math students, we kind of want to read these problems and pick apart the points of information we're really going to need. And the numbers we're definitely going to need. We're going to need 15.5 million square miles. We're going to need the 1979 that goes with it. And then 13.6 million square miles and the year that goes with that. Or kilometers. Oh, sorry, kilometers. I'm sorry. I'm tired. Okay, so write a set of ordered pairs. Now, this is a really interesting idea because... Ordered pairs means, well, one, there's a pair, there's dual there, so we're going to have to make pairs out of these. But two, there's an order, and we hopefully know what that order is. X comes first, Y comes second, but X is the independent variable. That's what matters more to us. So it's the independent variable has to come first, the dependent variable has to come second. And we have to be able to make two sets of them. Okay, so what's independent here? What do we, you know, how do I put this? What keeps on ticking, ticking, ticking into the future, no matter what. Yes, the calendar year, exactly. So your calendar year is your independent variable, right? It, and quite frankly, calendar year is often your independent variable. Um, now, why do I say calendar year? Because, you know, that's the year on the calendar that it is. Like, right now it's 2012, and after January it'll be 2013, that kind of thing. As opposed to, like, um, uh, stopwatch time, like how fast somebody can swim a race. That's not generally independent. But the year that something's happening, that tends to be independent because we can't really control it. We don't have those kinds of superpowers. Okay, so that one's going to have to come first in the ordered pair. And the sea ice extent is going to have to come second. That's the dependent variable. Now, the other thing to keep in mind here is that it pays. I know it seems kind of silly, but it pays to write this down somewhere. Um, for a lot of these problems like figure out which ones you're independent which ones you're dependent and write it down for yourself because it'll help you later on when you have to answer more questions okay so i wrote that down and then what they were asking for was the ordered pair part so that's what i underlined right here so in 1979 because that's my year that's my x i had 15.5 million square kilometers and then in 2006 i had 13.6 million square kilometers all right so there's the ordered pairs all good with that then they want us to find the average rate of change. Okay, well, the average rate of change is this lovely formula up here. We need to find the change in y over the change in x. But y is sea ice and x is calendar year, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to take the change in the sea ice, right, and divide it by the change in year. And I put the little formula up there. Okay, so that was 13.6 was the second of those two, right? It doesn't actually really matter which one you pick, but most students and myself included just kind of say, okay, that second one, that's the one that's Y2, and this one over here, that's Y1. Fine. So I put 13.6. Um, I'll make this a little smaller so you guys can see. So 13.6 minus the 15.5, and I just kind of put in the units so I wouldn't forget because that's the sea ice extent. It's not like 13.6 feet or something. This is 13.6 million square kilometers. It's a huge amount. Okay, minus 15.5 and then 2006 minus 1979. And I just kind of put the unit in there so I don't forget. This is talking about years. And then you just use your calculator, right? You find 13.6 minus 15.5 or you can do it in your head, you know, as some would. And then you divide it by, you find what this is, right? Subtract that. You get 27. And then you do that division with your calculator, negative 1.9 over 27. Now you want to, why am I dividing it? Why don't I just leave it like this with this thing? Well, because a rate of change has to be a unit ratio. You need that denominator to be 1. And currently it is 27. That is not good, right? You need unit ratio. So you 
you divide, you take one negative 1 1.9, divide it by 27 with your calculator, you'll get about 0 0.07, negative 0 0.07, excuse me. And you keep your units. So the y unit was million square kilometers, so you write that, and then the x unit was years. So it's million square kilometers per year. You can divide numbers, but you can't divide words yes. with a calculator. You can divide numbers, but you can't divide words with a calculator. I don't know if you can hear him, but there you go. All right, we're all done with that one. It's, uh, it's worth noting at the top if you go and scroll up. It's worth noting at the top if you scroll up. <laughs> That's what he's saying. I don't know how well you can but hear him. For this problem here, this mm -hmm. example number two, you could actually write those as ordered pairs themselves. That's true. We could have written this problem as an ordered pair set. We could have said 7 a.m. comma, well, here, if you like, 760. That was the first ordered pair. And then the second ordered pair was 1168. Again, the weird thing about this is that you got to be careful with afternoon versus morning. Like if they're both in the morning, that's cool. If they're both in the afternoon, that's cool. But if you start mixing and matching, switch to military time. That's what I say. <laughs> but they can see that the formula actually applies there. And that that's true. That's what this was. So this was really the change in y right here that I was using, right? Y2 minus y1, and this is really the change in x, x2 minus x1. So it's really the same as the formula we're using right down here and in this formula box right there. All right, we're going to stop right there, and we'll pick up back here for this next problem. So we'll see you then.